Good evening and welcome to another ed edition of Inside the Ro Issues um, produced by the League of Women Voters Richfield. My name is Maureen Scalia and I serve as the moderator. Today we're very uh, pleased to have with us uh, three people who are employed by the Minnesota Valley Natural Wildlife Refuge. Did I get all the words in there? You're close. Nation, national. <laughs> national? Uh-huh. Okay. And, well, most Americans are familiar with our national park system. Mm -hmm. Not very many, I suspect, are familiar with the wildlife uh, refuge um, part system. of the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, mm -hmm. which I do or do not know whether or not they manage the national parks, too. No. No. We're... we're um, most of the students I work with are very confused by this too. So what I like to tell them is we're kind of the sister organization to the National, National Parks. Parks. So National Parks and the Fish and Wildlife Service both fall under the Department of Interior. Okay. But we have a different focus than National yeah. Parks. And um, uh, before we get into introductions a little more about what you guys do and how you got to the positions you hold, I found kind of the mission sta statement of the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, and I think it's a pretty good one, one of the better ones I've read, is the primary federal agency responsible for conserving, protecting, and enhancing fish and wildlife and their habitats for the continuing benefit of the American people. That's kind of a mouthful, but gosh, is that important that we preserve these areas so for both the wildlife and the fish can continue to be there for our children and grandchildren. So. Exactly. Yes. So uh, now I will introduce you. On my immediate left, we have Nicole Menard, yes. who is our biology technician. We'll find out what that means. Mm -hmm. And then we have Sarah Inouye-Lise. Yes. And she is the volunteer coordinator. And that was new to me. I didn't realize you could volunteer in, uh, down at the refuge. Yes. And then on our far left is Suzanne um, Trapp, uh, who is our visitor uh, specialist or person. And you're probably the face of what the visitors see. I mean, when they come to visit, what they find there is kind of something you've had your hand in in terms of trying to educate them. Correct? Me and, and a staff of people. We have, okay. we have multiple visitor <laughs> services specialists at the refuge, thank goodness. <laughs> okay. uh, let's start with you, Suzette. How, what background found you being a visitor? Visitor services specialist. specialist. It's really funny. It's more um, ironic to me that I ended up in Minnesota than that I'm a visitor services specialist. I grew up on the beach down in Florida. I'm a Floridian <laughs> by heart, um, but I've been here long enough that during this heat wave, I too, like all the Minnesotans, whined about it. This is true. Uh, but I, I, all, I grew up exploring. I grew oh. up interested in every plant and critter, spent lots of times catching things, bringing them home, learning about them, studying them. Um, so I just, it was kind of a natural progression for me. I thought about being a teacher for a while, but I really didn't have that much interest in teaching other subjects than biology. And so I found this interesting career path and uh, never turned back. So um, are you a college graduate in biology then? Is I have. The, um, kind of the basic start? Yeah, we, we all started with some kind of biological background. So I went to Purdue University. That was my first migration. It's north. First stop on my migration north. <laughs> um, yeah, and I studied environmental science there. So I had okay, a, a background in you know lots of different biological subjects and then uh, decided that I really liked environmental education and was accepted at the University of Wisconsin Stevens Point for a master's program. And uh, they were very uh, wise in pointing me to the Fish and Wildlife Service and I've been with them now for uh, 20 years. All 20 years in the upper Midwest? Or uh, did yes. you ever go south again? <laughs> I, d I haven't and you know that's really unusual for staff of the wildlife refuge system one of the benefits is being able to go to all these different places all over the country. But I came here, 
uh, kind of fell in love with the Twin Cities, uh, had very Minnesotan boys, and we just have never left. Oh, okay. So, yeah. That makes sense. Sarah? <laughs> Well, I, I guess I'm the longest Minnesota resident of, of the three of us. <laughs> I've been here since I was, um, oh gosh, four years old, I believe. Um, but, you know, in college, I, I majored in biology and then picked up an environmental studies major as well. And I was always interested, I, or I've been interested in the outdoors. Um, and just, I got an internship um, when I was in college at Sherburne National Wildlife Refuge, so not... Oh, on the north yep. side, uh, yeah. close to St. Cloud, or at least on the way to St. Cloud. Yeah, mm -hmm. yep, not too far in Zimmerman. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so I, I spent a summer there, um, and I did a lot of things that I hadn't done before, because I, I spent most of my time growing up in the city, so... Um, that was an eye-opening experience, but after that I was hooked, so... Um, <laughs> The next summer I, I got an internship at Minnesota Valley and um, and then after I graduated from college it was uh, I guess a special kind of internship where um, you were able to work and go to school and then once you graduated if there was a position available then they'd, they'd try and place you. Um, oh, so great. I was placed at Minnesota Valley and I've been there ever since which is which is unique because I've been there for a little over 15 years. So oh, that's for, great. For quite a while. <laughs> <laughs> okay. That's great. And Nicole, your turn. Yeah. Well, I have uh, something similar to Suzanne where just, you know, growing up I loved to be outside. I would roam around outside with my dog and I loved learning new things and teaching myself about the things I was seeing out in nature. But it never occurred to me that I could make a job out of that, that I could uh -huh. do these things that I loved as a profession until I was looking into colleges and I ended up at University of Wisconsin Stevens Point. Um, but they have a great natural resources program. I was going to say, is they that uh, they're known for that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and once I made it, I was like, all right, now I, I know what, what I'm going to do. But then I found out there's all these different majors and things to study, and do I want to be in forestry or environmental education? And I went with natural resource management, and I really liked that holistic view that it gave me of, of um, you know, a, a great background to be able to do a, a great many things nice. that I'm doing now. And right now, what does a biology technician do? A lot of biological field work. Okay, so you're actually out there observing, um, I, yeah, you're doing get, restoration work? Yeah, all? you know, I'm, I'm in a cool position where I get to do everything from the beginning stages to the end. So I get to think about what's the research qu question, what, what is the thing that we want to know more about? How do we um, design a study to go about that? How do we find the appropriate protocol? Then I go out and I, and I use the methods to collect that data, and then I have to be able to organize it and understand it and see how it fits back into our answering our research question or telling us how our management, um, you know, how it's, the environment is responding to the things that we've been doing and, and where do we go from there. Okay. So I love it. Yeah. Well, it sounds exciting. Um. Maybe if I could turn back the clock, <laughs> I <laughs> wouldn't have gone part. the medical route. I would have gone more in the natural because, like all of you, the outdoors to me is a very special place, very, very special place. Other than we were talking before the show started about the problem with rabbits in the garden. So I guess that's one piece of wildlife I just not soon have around. Um, so tell us about the Minnesota Valley um, Wildlife Refuge. Uh, for those of us in the metro area, it is the valley of the Minnesota River. And it starts Fort Snelling? The and how far does it go? From Bloomington down to Henderson now? Yeah. Mm -hmm. About 70 miles along the Minnesota River. So that whole area, and you have, obviously you don't have all of the flood but you have a chunk of it centering on the river. So you mm -hmm. have land we have on both sides. We have parcels on Parc both sides, and it's not always continuous, but um, like Suzanne was saying earlier, sometimes there's different state lands or things that help us form a corridor along the river. Mm -hmm. And that's important for the wildlife? Very important for the wildlife. I think it's confusing for the public because what they see is one big chunk of habitat, which is you know what we're, we're trying to achieve. Um, but it gets very convoluted when you try to figure out what's federally owned, what's state owned, what's county owned. And what um, you can do on each of those and areas. What you can do on <laughs> they each all one. got their own <laughs> rules and regulations. There is, and you really need to know where you are, you know, and when you've crossed a boundary. Uh, in the visitor services program, you can pick up 
and you can download off the web maps for each one of these parcels. We call them units. Yeah, and let's talk about, as long as we're talking about it, uh, people might kind of recognize some of the names of them. Mm -hmm. um, Bloomington? Uh, the Bloomington unit um, has Long Meadow Lake Marsh on it. When you drive across Highway 77, you're looking at Refuge right there. Okay. Um, old Cedar Avenue where the um, new bridge, well, the, the old bridge the being old re bridge. refurbished um, there. Wilkie unit is down um, kind of abuts the um, amusement Fair. park, Valley yeah. Fair. Valley Fair, okay. Yeah. And if you keep going down 169, um, where the Renaissance Festival had historically been held out there, uh, we butt right up against that at Louisville Swamp. So literally when oh, you're driving yeah. and you're turning Louisville. right into the Renaissance parking lot, you could turn left and be on the refuge. And then there's Black Dog, yeah. which is kind of unique in the sense that's privately owned. That's a company parcel. Yes, but man, and, uh, we have an agreement to manage parts of that, and they've been great partners. With Excel, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And that's just, it's just the south. west and southwest of, like, the uh, Cedar or yeah. more yeah. Uh, Burnsville. Yeah, yep. south of there. Mm -hmm south of our Long Meadow Lake unit and, and the places that Suzanne mentioned, Old okay. Cedar and 77. Well, I wrote them all down. Uh, Rapids Lake? Rapids Lake is undiscovered yet, I think. Uh, if okay. you really want a wild, wild experience, so to speak, uh, it's a great destination when you're heading down to Jordan, okay, the Chaska area. Yeah, you cross uh, the river there at County Road 9. Okay. And it's so it's on the opposite side of the river from Louisville Swamp. And the trail there um, runs right along the river. So you get a really different view uh, oh. of what's happening on the Minnesota River there. A lot of uh, restored prairie that we've been working on down there. Very different from the Bloomington end. And we do have a visitor center, a larger visitor center. It's also a headquarters on the Bloomington um, the, the start of Long Meadow Lake unit there. And then at Rapids Lake, we have a smaller education and visitor center. Oh. And that is primarily open right now during the visitor center, during the school year. We meet a lot of school groups out there, but all the trails on all the units are open from uh, dawn to dusk. So people can hike and, and get out there, explore. And just That's really sit there on the rock and look <laughs> and watch, yeah, too. Yeah, exactly. People need to bring binoculars. If wanna they want to stop by the vis either visitor center, they can check out binoculars oh, for free. So yeah. yeah, and take them with them. That shouldn't keep them from um, going out and exploring. Okay. Uh, during the winter, you can also, in those same visitor centers, borrow snowshoes. So if you want to try exploring mm -hmm. the trails. Are the trails groomed in the winter time? No, no, you just have to. No, nope. okay. but you know, we have enough field trip group traffic that it doesn't take very long before they appear groomed. You know, they've <laughs> okay. been they do the down. hard work so that you can walk yeah. with, with these. <laughs> In other words, just follow the tracks. Pretty so. much, pretty okay, much. Okay, yeah. unless yeah. it just snowed. Mm -hmm. Sure. Well, that sounds, I mean, it's so much more extensive than I ever dreamed, and I really encourage my audience that the website is fantastic and you print out all the maps you need and, mm -hmm. and you have the visitor center to kind of scope out and mm -hmm. start with maybe the Bloomington one and then. A lot of people do that. I hear a lot of people that visit Rapids Lake started at Bloomington and learned about us down there. Um, one of the things too to keep in mind is we are, everything that we do, is, well I shouldn't say everything, but mm -hmm. the vast majority of everything we do is free and so Families can come and enjoy an interpretive program. They can borrow materials. They can explore the exhibits. And there's no cost to them for any of that. So it really is a good value. A good value. And I, I you know, growing up on a farm, always outside, I, I think our kids are really missing that experience. And for some kids who don't have access to traffic and, and cars as much as other kids, 
they never really get to know the, the natural world as much as people who have parents, maybe that can take them wherever they want to go. Um, and it's not just a river, you know, you don't just stand there on a beach or along the river. There really are a number of different habitats. And uh, yeah. do you want to talk about that a little yeah. bit and anybody else chime in? That's something that's really neat about the refuge because some refuge areas might be one hab habitat. They're known for their grasslands and that's what you'll see. But at Minnesota Valley National Wildlife Refuge, we have the grasslands, the prairie. We have the floodplain forests, you know, along the Minnesota River that you've been talking about. Um, we have a lot of wetlands, you know, lakes that are permanent but also things that change throughout the year and they bring great migratory birds, so great bird watching spots on the refuge. And then we have oak savannas, which we've talked about a little before the show. And those are just prairies that have like burr oaks or different oak trees scattered throughout them. So that brings some different wildlife species. And, and that's an unfamiliar term for a lot of people is a savanna and oaks. Mm -hmm. I think oaks in a forest, but we're, we're not talking about that. So this is transition period or habitat? Yeah, um, and we're, we're losing a lot of our oak savannas in Minnesota and throughout the Midwest. So the refuge is really, um, we're doing what we can to protect the remnant parcels that we have. So there are some areas that have not been farmed yet. Oh. They have never been farmed and they don't have that kind of tiling underneath the soil. And so they still have that native seed bank. And even though they're small, and, I mean, sometimes they're right up in the metro area, like in Eden Prairie, or, you know, people drive by them every day and they don't know. But they're really spectacular places, and, um, and we're working hard to keep managing and restoring them. And, and so they can be these grasslands, and then what happens is if you don't pay, you know, if you're not doing some, some management, then the trees can encroach, as and many of us know from our backyards or <laughs> See, whatever, anything will it crumble. can turn into something else. And yeah. so we try to keep it in, in a state that it, you know, as close to its historic conditions as we can. And does that mean, too, of the flood plain floods, um, that the bur oak is more adaptable to periodic water? Well, the bur oak will be up at the oak oh. savanna, so that's oh, okay. more of an upland. Uh, upland species, but in the floodplain forest, exactly the species that are there can can withstand that kind of water depth and the duration. So silver maple. Okay, I was going to ask what, you. Yeah, what silver that? maples and cottonwood and and those trees, you know, have strategies for how to live and how to how to um, spread their seeds and and how to how to keep living in in that kind of a. Um, saturated environment and as we know and I'm sure you do too that water can get awfully high I and you can see the water the marks on the trees and it's amazing so that they keep living I mean I've driven over the cedar or the 35w and looked and you know those trees are are covered up until where they start branching out yeah. mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we haven't had that lately but right but a couple uh, years ago yeah so but we so we expect that every so often and that's what it's supposed to do you know it's the, the river floods and we, we adapt to that and see what it's going to do this year and what it's going to do the next year. So I had it backwards. So you've got the river and maybe there's a little strip of grass and whatnot and a wetland and then you move up to the, oak, the floodplain forest, forest. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and then above that would be the oak savanna. Yeah, yeah, prairie and oak savanna up top. Oh, so those two are kind of together, the mm -hmm. oak savanna and the prairie. Oak savanna is basically bur oak with prairie underneath. Neath it. Bur oak okay. is the, the one species, because of its big, heavy, corky bark, can withstand fire. Uh, fire. Oh, so because in, I was, that yeah. occurred to me. I know somewhere it's in the info on the website, they talked mm -hmm. about... Uh, Fire-dependent communities, or, or yeah. the, they, you know, communities, plant communities that need frequent disturbance and fire is one of them and the and exactly the burrow can withstand that and and so can also those native um, grass species they really sort of respond and are invigorated by by that kind of ah. fire and um, so that helps to sort of keep the prairie get that controlled fire through there every every so often and then way above that you've got kind of a natural deciduous forest or farmland yeah, we have some upland forested areas. Um, they can be at the at the top of the bluffs, or but that's that's not a big part of our habitat type. No, um, we we have more of some of the other ones that I mentioned. Okay. 
but yeah, those are wonderful, you know, areas as well, and we get, you know, deer and everything else going through, through our woodlands. Yeah, do we want to talk about some of the birds and, and whatnot? Uh, somebody pop in and say what they've seen <laughs> in there. I'll, I mean, unless you guys want to go. <laughs> We do get a lot of waterfall in our in our wetland yeah. areas, um, and then when the water goes down, a lot of shore shorebirds will come through too. So, um, as Nicole was mentioning before, during migration in the spring, a lot of the birders will come out because it's a great area to be able to see some species that you don't get to see at other other times of the year, or sometimes something um, interesting will just happen to to migrate to the to the refuge. So. At Rapids Lake, we'll get, and I'm sure at other parts of the refuge too, but I. Um, have spent a lot of time down at Rapids Lake specifically, and we'll get big flocks of white pelicans yeah. come oh, through. Oh, That's really spectacular. Okay. You know, um, oh, yeah. go, sorry. go ahead. You mentioned black dog, and that yeah. area has um, some really neat birds because um, they have warm water going through the lakes throughout um, oh. the winter. So in the winter, they'll have overwintering eagles, but in the migration times, I've seen flocks of 300 plus white pelicans flying around and circling around and, and fishing in, in Black Dog Lake. And so that's really quite a sight if you haven't seen that. Wow. Yeah, I mean, it's kind of April, May we're talking, or mm -hmm. even March. Yeah. Those times. Yeah, and then Sarah, Sarah's right, too. We'll get some some kind of stray yeah. birds, some t you know, <laughs> things that we might not normally see, and that's really cool. And we have very active birders, and they, they post, you know, on different bird websites, and they'll, they'll let us know what they're seeing, and that helps us keep track of such things. But our regular type of birds would be, you know, th things that are migrating through. Would, uh, we have trumpeter swans. We have, uh -huh. you know, a range of duck species. And um, again, like Sarah was mentioning, sometimes if we manage our water levels and so it gets low enough so that there's exposed mud flats, we get some really neat marsh birds oh. that are walking around in, in the mud and picking out invertebrates. And so we get the range. What are marsh birds? I mean, I'm like a sora or uh, just so birds that are, um, they need to be in exposed. They're not like a duck that's swimming in the water. They're on the in exposed. In the mud. Yes. And they're walking and they're digging out things out of the mud. Um, that can only happen when the, the water has receded a bit. Okay. And they're very secretive, so they're hard to see. You might have to learn them by their call oh. or, uh, or go with an experienced birder. And so, like Suzanne um, was talking about different programs, perhaps. We have uh, really great birders that lead programs at Rapids Lake and at Bloomington. And so you can go with someone that knows their stuff <laughs> and <laughs> help you identify what you're seeing and hearing. And it's, it's really the way to, to start out. Oh, cool. The, going on a program is really helpful for the warblers too that come through because warblers? there's so many different yeah, yeah different kinds of, of warblers and yeah mm. and our volunteers time. our volunteer interpretive rangers they love to teach people mm -hmm. so if you're a little intimidated to maybe go out with the Minnesota River Valley Audubon chapter you know <laughs> oh you yeah they're professionals mm -hmm. quote unquote you can start with a beginner birding class and just uh -huh. start by learning what's at the feeders and then okay. you know slowly add to your your repertoire but we have really uh, lots of different options for beginning birders all the way up to the real serious folks that are keeping a life list and are okay. looking for the real special things and you'll know them because their camera is this big <laughs> 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 and it's great it's a great wildlife photography area and well that's another thing is on the website talked about the perfect place if you're you know really into photography with all the fancy lenses and but I'll bet the cell phones work good too. <laughs> they, we have had some workshops on yeah. how to take good pictures with your cell phone, and uh, we have quite a few photography yeah, workshops. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. And um, um, you know, hiking is the big thing, obviously. And in the winter, i you know snowshoeing and whatnot. Uh, fishing. Mm -hmm. We've got obviously along the river. We've got trout for sure. We have other things in the water? Yeah, at our Bass Ponds location, which is um, not oh, too far from our, our visitor center, probably like closer to the Mall of America. Um, it's another entry point to our Long Meadow Lake unit. But um, at that area, we actually have a pond that's designated a fishing in the neighborhood pond by the DNR. Um, oh. So they'll, they'll stock it when they can, and then um, it, we have a pier out there, and it's a great place. You can great fish place from the dock in this thing or pier. Mm -hmm. As a matter of fact, we have expanded. We traditionally do a uh, 
fishing program, Youth Fish Day for our uh, fifth grade students and oh. our partner school program. So these are students that we've been working with for four and five years, seeing them three times a year. And it's kind of the graduation event. They're really excited to get out there, spend a day learning about fishing, actually try to catch fish. Um, and we found that so successful, we've started uh, community fishing events. Oh. And the next one will be in Edina. Yep. Uh, and then in September, we will be hosting one at the Bass Ponds. So to find more information from that, you just go to our calendar events on our website, and it'll tell you exactly where and when. And you don't have to bring anything. Just show up. Mm -hmm. Just show up. and Just then show up. Mm -hmm. uh, adults. Bait and everything. adults do need a fishing. Yes. <laughs> so it's for adult beginning fishing, too. As well as kids. But, yeah. yeah. It, yeah. <laughs> oh, cool. That's really um, neat. And um, hunting, um, I mean, do you allow them in pretty much all of the units, hunting, or just some? Just some. Yeah, hunting is not compatible with every other public use. Okay. And isn't necessarily appropriate on every one of our units. So right now, the vast majority of hunting opportunities are down at the Rapids Lake area and okay. at the Louisville Swamp area. And there is... Um, a very descriptive, detailed brochure about our hunting rules and regulations uh, that hunters can pick up and figure out you know, where they can hunt depending on what kind of animal they're hunting for. Um, at Rapids Lake, our hunting areas are signed. So if people want to hike in those areas, they certainly are allowed to. We encourage them to either check out a, a red blaze orange vest from us or to bring something appropriate. We want them to know that they're hiking in a hunting area, but they're not prohibited from doing that. Okay, I was going to ask that because if you've got trails going through the whole unit, right? you know, how, did, how is that compatible with hunting? But So for the most part, people are a little bit discouraged maybe from hiking well, that hunting season? We encourage them to be aware. Aware and we careful. We encourage them to be aware. And uh, as far as our field trips go and our school groups, we don't take them into the open hunting areas during hunting season. Okay. And what are they mostly after, like duck and uh, deer and pheasant or? I, guess I think they've bears. expanded. Oh. Um, I, the Most of the questions I get at Rapids Lake are about um, deer mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and waterfowl mm -hmm. we've been getting because we do hold some um, youth waterfowl hunting classes oh. down at Rapids Lake so we're getting more and more um, questions about that particular species and then we will get some questions about turkeys we have quite say, a few turkeys uh -huh. down there oh yeah, yeah. that's a big one because mm -hmm. mm -hmm. I've seen wild turkeys up about what was it about 90th well, just south of uh, all those big, tall bay buildings, south of 84. We have a good turkey population. It's very a healthy healthy turkey say. population. They're right in the parking lot. And it's amazing how scarce they are around hunting season. It's yeah. like they know. They know. Yeah. yeah. So the, so the information about what time of the year it is. It's gotten out it's to them. It's passed on. <laughs> Interesting. But, yeah, you see wild turkeys more now than... I mean, I never saw them from until the last few years. Is that uh, with what you see down in the refuge too? Is turkey population expanding? Um, it seems pretty healthy to me. I mean, um, and, and it has been for the last several of the years. Yeah, I think around the refuge we've we've had a bunch of turkeys since yeah. Since Which I is great for visitors because they yeah. they do enjoy seeing them at the refuge, not necessarily <laughs> in their yard or, or, or when they're trying to drive the, somewhere. Yeah, crossing the street. <laughs> I mean, you know, the ducks crossing the street with the ducklings too. Mm -hmm. um, okay, well, what? Let's see. I was going to say there's other types of hunt. You know, it's really. Um, certain areas but there are also different types so we have like bow hunting in certain areas so there oh. are there are things that appeal to certain people that they, they can only you know that they can do in a particular location so and we keep all that in mind like who would be in that location and and what areas are most suitable for that but I think that's something people enjoy to have those options. Mm -hmm. 
And at all the parking lots where of the units that we do allow hunting, there are signs and, and we put up the map. It's just, you know, so the hunters know what they can hunt and where, and then so visitors know, I guess, as well. What to what's, look for. What's to going on in there. Yeah. Do, do you see the numbers going up? I mean, are more people beginning to learn and come to the um, wildlife refuge? I think building the nature or the visitor center must have helped. Somewhat. At Rapids Lake? Or why and also at the Bloomington? Well, the Bloomington Visitor Center has been around for a long time. We're, we'll be celebrating our 40th anniversary oh. in October. Um, the building hasn't been up that Okay, it's that a many newer years. building. Okay, um, that's what it is. Do you recall the I year? I believe it was, it was built in, in 1989, okay. but opened in 1990, okay. I think. So. Okay. okay. Yeah, so it's been around quite a while. I think in a metropolitan area like this, with so many options and so many competing events, that it's always a challenge to get the word out yeah. about what you know what's going on at any given time in our visitor services program and uh, word of mouth has been really important uh, we we see a lot more adults than we ever thought we would in our environmental education program because they chaperone their oh. students field trips I think uh, crunching this year's numbers we had 1089 adults oh my God. chaperoning their their students field trips so um, we're getting the word out a lot that way, but we still hear every weekend. Mm -hmm. We never, we never knew you were here. Oh well, I mean, I kind of knew it was there, but you know, you're busy, and maybe you go to the zoo yeah, yeah. or the, the right. little more plushy animals, <laughs> maybe. Um, but I didn't really set foot there until this year, and I'm thinking, what was wrong with me? So hopefully. The word is getting out and the websites and programs like this. Programs like it. this help a lot. We really appreciate the invitation. Yeah, because it's, yeah. it's great. So um, you said a lot of the species of the vegetarian type, not the vegetarian, but the uh, herbivores. Uh, plant life, the bot oh. botany portion botany. Of, of biology. Um, the seeds, and they require uh, burns, periodic burns, mm -hmm. uh, is the the various units on some kind of a schedule, so you do do um, scheduled would be, burns? That would be ideal. Oh, but uh, the... um, And we do have that in mind, so, but we have um, one fire management officer and, um, you know, actually a lot of acreage yes. you know, to get through. And then because they're prescribed burns, they need certain, you know, there's a prescription of a specific wind and all these different conditions that need to be in place to be able to burn certain areas. So we find that sometimes our windows get kind of short um, to find those times to burn. And we typically have been burning in the spring and the fall, but now we're st starting to think about can we burn at different times of the year and what would be some of the pros and cons, what, what, what vegetation would it help and what would it set back. And so we just have, um, um, we're kind of we'll try to put our top priorities to our, our burn um, a burn boss, and, and we see what, what we can get done together, and it's usually a good amount, but not everything. Yeah, yeah, I can imagine it would be difficult with, I mean, you're not that far from residential housing. That's what I was going to say, uh, yeah. is that that's probably, you know, some of the things that we, uh, you know, some of the challenges that we have that a lot of other refuges, you know, they're, they're right up against a dirt road, or, uh, you know, they don't have all these, uh, businesses and airports right. yeah. and and all these things that we need to coordinate with and be concerned about and in, in, in the public use certainly so speaking of airports <laughs> what effect if any uh, does do you see on the wildlife from I mean obviously a very noisy um, it is um, occurrence I don't know that we can document and, and we've looked into studies about you know, what can we show that would be impacts to wildlife and um, but we know that it impacts us. <laughs> so, yeah, you know, down so, at Bass Ponds, yeah. I, I hear the kids will say in the spring, oh, it's so noisy down here. I feel that the wildlife 
at the bass ponds, the birds in particular, are louder oh. than they oh. are in other places. And you know, we have to stop and wait for an airplane to pass before we continue speaking so the kids can hear us. And I just wonder if they have adjusted their uh, oh. loudness to communicate with each other, to be heard over the... Now, of course, you, we have no studies to document that, but when I compare that location to some other places that I work with children, I feel like the wildlife is just very loud. Oh, interesting. Yeah. That they have adapted to the airplane noise and then to get their message across to uh, mates and, and other animals, they have just adjusted their volume. Well, to it be just louder. might be my imagination, but we can't prove it. <laughs> <laughs> they did. There's been no studies yeah. that have. Then they're you know, expending design. energy and things like that to try to be, you know, heard. heard and things like that. So it's hard to put all that together, but but yes, yeah. yeah, we are under the flight path. Yeah. Well, and, and I have to think birds, uh, uh, evolution says that if they want to stop at the bass pond for whatever reason, mm -hmm. they're just going to have to learn to put up with the noise from an urban environment. I mean, they're just going to have to. And we certainly have a lot of birds in that area. Right. So, the, they're, so they're finding something that they like. And, they, they and hopefully it's our beautiful wetlands. <laughs> yeah, the, I was going to say the wetlands. <laughs> And wetlands were finding out more and more are uh, so important to the whole agricultural community too. I mean, soil erosion, all of that kind of thing. And with the Minnesota, by articles in the paper and whatnot, is very polluted and lots of soil draining off of it. How does that affect it by the time it gets down, you know, by Eden Prairie, let's say? and all that silt comes rusting down, and maybe some of the pollutants, too. Is that happening? Yeah, well, we do see that, and not just with the agricultural contaminants, but because um, we're in the river valley, all the things that are up top on the bluff, like the salt for de-icing oh, roads, the roads, and pe the things that people put in their yards, you know, different, uh, so all of that washes down the bluff into our, our wetlands and then into the, the river. So we see, and so I think, you know, we work closely with the, with the cities to have sort of a stormwater treatment so that there's sort of a catchment basin so that the, the stuff that goes down the storm sewer is, ends up at, a, at their pond and not necessarily so in, in our river. lake. And then, you know, they keep tabs on that. So uh, we do have some partnerships like that that help. But, yeah, certainly those things are, are in our, our water and system. affecting the quality of the water going through. Well, and wetlands were designed, you know, by nature to filter pollutants. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if we stick to nature's design, a lot of those things wouldn't get into the Minnesota River. But there's so many places along the river that it's have strict. lost their yeah. wetlands uh, and capability. Yeah, that buffering spot. And so, where does the Minnesota start? Uh, Big it, Stone? Yep, in Ortonville, yeah. Big okay. Stone Lake in Ortonville. And at that point, coming out of that lake, it's small, I would imagine. I've never been there. It's probably some place to go see. I mean, the Minnesota is a very long river. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, originally used to be a glacial river. Is that correct? Yes. Yep. Um, it was the Glacial River Warren back. I guess way back then, <laughs> many About, years ago. What was it, 13, 14,000 yeah. years ago? <laughs> I guess um, when the glaciers receded, um, there was a, a lake called Lake Agassiz that covered, oh gosh, was it most of the Dakotas, mm -hmm. part of northern Minnesota, and then up into Canada. And then when that the banks of the that lake broke, then that's when the Glacial River Warren formed. And um, it went south until it hit Man Mankato, hit some bedrock, and then turned north. So it's, it's kind of interesting to think that the river, w you know, where we're on is, is, is flowing north. It's so. very, very old. Yes. <laughs> I wonder if that means it's older than the Mississippi. Could be. I mean, those were glacial lakes, some of those up there. And probably formed after, or about the same time as Agassiz. Yeah. 
I did not know. So it's a very strong bedrock that at Mankato that forces yeah. that dip. Yep, and if you, I guess if you look on, on a map of Minnesota, you can definitely see that. Yeah. It's like a sharp, it looks like a V. Yeah, almost. almost a V. Yeah. <laughs> so, so. It's really so besides all the natural beauty, there's a geological interest too. And, yeah. and does that get pointed out by the guides once in a while? Or? Most, of, most of our volunteer interpreters and our seasonal staff, most of the time we focus on wildlife and habitat, yeah. but you know, people always come with their own interests. Yeah, so okay. sometimes you'll have someone working for you that knows a lot about mm -hmm. the Native American history oh, associated yeah. with a site and will share that too, or the geology of a particular area. Uh, we do have a glacial erratic, uh, very big boulder mm -hmm. down in uh, the Louisville Swamp Unit, and we will have people coming specifically looking to boulder on that. Oh. Um, and that's not something I think we ever envisioned as a public use on this refuge. Um, so, you know, it all depends on really who's on staff and at any given year as to what kinds of program programs we focus on. And during the summertime, uh, obviously there's much more use of the refuge. Uh, you have seasonal staff. What's the makeup of that? Are these interns? Generally, they're um, university students that have identified a career, potentially a career in biology or in environmental education, um, sometimes also in maintenance, and they will apply through any number of programs that we partner with to come and spend a summer working on the refuge. And then refuge staff uh, that are in the same program area that they have shown interest in will kind of mentor them, give them opportunities to try new things. Um, as Sarah was mentioning, we do have a very special internship where if you're accepted into that, there's the potential for employment later down the line. Oh, so there's um, a direct... Yes, yeah. but not all of our interns come through that program. I mean, there's YCC oh. yeah, and... that's for high school students. Oh, high school. Mm -hmm. And then what are the other college level um, programs? Well, we only, work, in biology, we work with the interns program. Okay. And um, we have had something called the Career Discovery Internship Program. So that's for folks that aren't really sure if this is what they want to do. do there they may be a freshman, they tend to be kind of, you know, younger, they're still kind of green in school and they're figuring out what they want to do. And if this seems remotely interesting to them, <laughs> then they'll give it a then they'll give it a shot. And so they're starting from scratch and it's really cool to see the wealth of knowledge they'll pick up over, over a summer. summer. And sometimes they decide you know, there's a lot of uh, experiences that they can use and, and they might continue in that vein. And sometimes they'll think yeah, I think I'll try something yeah. else. <laughs> Depends on how bad the mosquitoes were. You know? yeah. and, and the ticks. <laughs> yeah. There are so, drawbacks to everything. <laughs> but so it's kind of nice to have that range of people that are you know, feeling it out and people that know exactly and they're getting some really solid experience and they're able to build themselves up. Okay. And, and it's great. Uh, sometimes we get those people to return and then they can take on more responsibilities and work more closely with us. And that's fantastic. And there's another group that's out at the refuge that we haven't talked about. And there's a volunteer program. Yes. Sarah, why don't you Definitely. take that away and really talk about what that's okay. all about? <laughs> um, well, we have a, a pretty vibrant volunteer program on the refuge. Um, I was just running the numbers for our, our end of year reporting. And this past year we had, oh gosh, it was over 12,200 volunteers. And I think it, or no, excuse me, excuse me, sorry. Hours. Let me back up. <laughs> 12,200 hours. Oh, and then, that's um, a lot. But, but it was over 600 volunteers, which is a, a increase from last year, which, you know, was, was 300. So it, we, we doubled, which is really exciting. But, um, yeah, there's um, different things that people can do depending on how much time they have or, or when, when they can come out. Um, we have some people who are there every week um, working in our visitor center. Um, They'll help us out answering questions or phones, and then um, we do have a friends group that is associated with us. So they'll, with, so there's a bookstore in, in our visitor center oh, too. Sure. So they'll they'll assist with with those items. Um, and then we have some volunteers who just like to get out hiking. So we have trail rangers, so they can just go out and hike the trails, and then let us know what's going on out there. Um, we like <laughs> we try and, and 
just see what people are doing hiking, if they're biking, you know, how many people they see taking pictures, because um, wildlife photography, as we said, is a, a big thing on the refuge. Um, and then they'll let us know what kind of maintenance needs are needed on the trails. I suppose as well. eyes and ears. <laughs> yes, definitely, because there's limited staff and, a, you know, as we said, 70 miles <laughs> along the Minnesota River <laughs> yeah. that we have a lot of, of land out there. Um, and then we have people who, who like doing habitat work, so we'll have mm -hmm. people come out and help us remove invasive species. Um, and then oh. in the fall, we'll do some seed collection, which is, which is always fun. Yeah, to it's do. been great for biology. Uh, <laughs> I think, Sarah, your position pretty, uh, for full-time volunteer coordinator mm -hmm. is pretty recent, right? A couple yeah, of years. And so, year so, so since she's been able to dedicate her time to working with volunteers and setting them up you know, where work needs to be done, then biology has taken full advantage. <laughs> and, um, you know, sometimes people have a scientific interest, like I, I, Sarah directed a volunteer towards me who's helping me identify macroinvertebrates, all of the insects that are in our wetlands. Oh. And that helps us determine what things we were talking about before, like the contaminants in the water, or how, um, how, how those insects can tolerate it or not. So it gives us an indication of wetland health. But anyway, invasive species, there's a lot, like there are all over the Twin Cities. So mm -hmm. volunteers uh, with Sarah help helps us Buck on habitat restoration. And, yeah, and some of those others. Garlic mustard. So <laughs> according to your interests, and if you want to walk along, you know, by yourself, you could be a trail ranger. If you want to be with a group, you can pull some weeds and be happy. <laughs> and and if you want to volunteer with school groups, you could do that mm -hmm. too. Yeah. Oh, oh, that would be another. Yes. We yep. do. We have a great crew of uh, folks that help us with our field trip program. So when those kids come out, we can break into small groups, and each group of five or six kids has an adult with them to help go out and explore. And it makes a huge difference in the quality of their experience when they're not one of 30, they're one yeah. of five. Five. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. So how late in the season um, do, are the kids coming out, or are they coming out all year? They're coming out all year. We have them um, starting right after school starts, and they run right up into the first week of June. Oh. And they come uh, to both the Bloomington Visitor Center as well as the Rapids Lake, and then um, we have several curriculum activities that are really focused at the bass ponds. So the teachers, um, either the teachers select what the field trip is going to look like, or if it's a school that we're working with the entire school, we have kind of a set curriculum that we run each grade level through, so we're sure that they don't repeat, you know, the, the same, same experiences. Stuff. Yeah. So... Oh, it's a big program. I I, for some reason, I just didn't realize, I mean, with this big, natural, huge, you know, what is it, 14,000 acres mm -hmm. or something yeah. like that? Yeah. That you would keep that going all winter. Oh, yeah. Oh, sure. We put the kids on the snowshoes. Get they them outside. They love the winter <laughs> activities. If we didn't have snow, they're really disappointed. <laughs> I mean, we still go out and do things, but they really want that snowshoe experience. Yeah. But this last year, we had just under 10,000 student visits um, oh to goodness. the refuge yeah. so it's it's a big program and we're always looking for more partners uh, to work with and looking for more teachers who are interested in learning about using the refuge as an outdoor classroom we do a lot of education workshops throughout the year or we host them um, and we have interns during the school year whereas biology focuses mostly on summer interns, mm -hmm. our interns are needed during the school year to work to with students. Teach. So uh, we have a bunkhouse actually yeah. at the Rapids Lake end for interns. It's very nice. And it's a I perk, of, a perk of working with us. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, cool. Because yeah. sometimes um, interns will be from all over the country. And if they're coming oh, from out sure. of state, then they need a place to stay. Or, or even if they're local, they can't. I mean, if you are into the intern program, then that's uh, available to you. Well, I suppose that would allow an intern from Florida <laughs> to come exactly. up and really get a sense of, of what the habitats are like in winter as well as summer. Yeah, you can really get a different, uh, different experience. And we've had practicum interns that have, uh, you know, spent their some, some of their previous experiences in California. We've had mm -hmm. some go on to work for the Park Service in Yellowstone. And so we get a lot of diversity in, in our internship programs. Because they really, the wildlife changes <laughs> kind of, 
Well, maybe not so drastic isn't quite w the word, but a lot of it leaves. Obviously, mm -hmm. the bird life leaves. Mm -hmm. You just pick up on different stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would you imagine. Have to, you have to look for tracks in the snow. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's the best time of year. To <laughs> so in terms of predators, um, because that's always important in the whole mm -hmm. chain of life, um, we have coyotes and well, you tell me what you have. I'd say coyotes is what we see the signs of the most. Right. Mm -hmm. That's our largest predator right? that we yeah, have. The largest predator. Well. Yeah. Yeah. But we, which is part of the reason for a hunt program. <laughs> I mean, hunting really has replaced the top predators. Mm -hmm. So um, the students that come out, you know, they they want to believe there's there's wolves and bears. And, <laughs> and so we educate them on the reality. They're yeah. a lot less fearful then, which is good. <laughs> yeah. um, but they take, they have a lot of fun looking for wildlife signs because most of our wildlife are going to be hard to spot mm -hmm. in a big group yeah. and during the middle of the day. Mm -hmm. So we do a lot of observation. The kids get to be really good little naturalists putting the clues together on what they find and collecting the data and works out to to be a really good experience for them. I'm really educational because educational. they're collecting data, analyzing data, and then... Making observations, mm -hmm. working as a team, mm -hmm. uh, predicting the outcomes, setting up their scientific inquiry, like Nicole was mentioning. Um, they do math. It's very multidisciplinary, so they're doing math, measuring, and mm -hmm. graphing, and all that. They do oh. English because they're um, working in journal bro books, uh, Fayed because they're getting sometimes more of a workout than they want. <laughs> they have to go up that hill. Yeah. And yeah. Yeah. <laughs> sometimes they come back really exhausted. Um, well, that's there's just, just a wonderful. lot to it. Yeah. Really wonderful. And obviously, the, the people, the, you know, maybe. Well, hike once in a while, but there's always a need for money for funds and all this stuff. Now, the Friends program, is that also kind of like a money-raising program? They're a, a nonprofit group, so they're a nonprofit group that's associated with the refuge. Um, a lot of the people are, are volunteers, so they do volunteer work on the refuge. But under their, their Friends, I guess their Friends umbrella, they are able to do more lobbying and, and fundraising, like the bookstore and... A lot of times they'll help us find sponsors for events, well, you know, uh, uh, corporations uh, that are interested in the same things we are, you know, so they'll go out and they'll look for, for help to get the things done that we couldn't do without. Yeah, I mean, support. let's face it, federal money's are kind of certainly not increasing <laughs> and, you know, that hurts, mm -hmm. so they can maybe buy s things from paper and pointers and whatnot. Well, you know, those kinds of things, we, our budget covers really oh. well. But one oh. of the things Refuge Friends uh, fundraises for us is uh, the Blue Goose, what we call the Blue Goose bus dollars. So the Blue Goose is a um, the character symbol, symbol of the not National a logo, Wildlife Refuge of, Center. of the Wildlife Refuge, refuge System. system. <laughs> Excuse me. Oh, the Blue Goose the blue is the goose. mascot, so, yeah. Yeah. So, so to speak. <laughs> and they have uh, funded over $30,000 worth of field trip busing reimbursement for our schools. Oh my God. So, you know, our budget is fine for taking care yeah. of what our office needs, but Based the schools it. that want to come out, you know, busing is a deterrent, especially if you ask them to bring their all their students and to bring them three times a year. So without the Refuge Friends, our partner school program wouldn't look like it looks right now. And, you know, I want to think, okay, well, you know, the most of the metro area is north of the river, mm -hmm. but I would imagine your reach goes out quite far, maybe as far as Fairbilt and Farmington and some of those cities. We've had inquiries about our, our education program that far out. Most schools don't want to spend more time on the bus than they're okay. going to spend on their field trips. So their field okay. trips are usually about two hours, so I'd say the vast majority of our uh, school programming is within about 30, 30 minute, 20 to 30 minute bus ride. Uh, but we do have quite a um, connection in Burnsville. Okay, we have some yeah. schools there, Shakopee, mm -hmm. Chaska, Jordan, Victoria, um, oh. Minneapolis, St. Paul, mm -hmm. 
Bloomington, yeah. That would be. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, quickly, we've got three minutes left. Is there anything we haven't covered in the, if you can think of anything? We just want to plug that it's the 40th anniversary of, of our refuge again, and so we'll be hosting events um, the week of October 2nd to 8th with a big event on October 8th, a Saturday. Mm -hmm. So people can join us for that if they, if they don't see us sooner. What kind of things will be going on? We're, We're still developing. We're yeah. still developing. Oh, planning still a party. The plan. yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but the, the idea is we really want people to try something new. Mm -hmm. So if you've never been to the refuge, I suppose everything would be new. But if you would like to try out a birding hike or you would like to try out a ranger-led bike ride or or you know, look at what's available and just come out and give it a try. We're going to have a kind of a smorgasbord of opportunities and hoping that we'll get some new people, you know, to, to check us out and and see what it's like to be involved with the activities on the refuge. Are there some trails, some <coughs> units, or I should put it this way, or some of the units have trails that are more pretty much flat land, not a lot of climbing, so people okay. with maybe bad knees or hips or something like that would find. Yeah. Is that yeah. the case? Yeah. Rapids Lake is pretty flat, the Rapids Lake Trail there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Rapids Lake would be one. Mm -hmm. Wilkie, um, there's the old Highway 18 is is oh, one of our trails that goes okay, that's And you can always call our number and you can ask specific questions like that and someone will help yeah, no, or let you know which has good topography for your knees Enjoying or not. People, uh, and I just like to, um, people can visit our website too to find out things like that, our trail maps and uh, to see when our internships are posted that Suzanne and I were talking about or volunteer Two opportunities. opportunities. Everything's on the website for Minnesota Valley National Wildlife Refuge. And that is just really, I mean, this has just been a wonderful, for my own personal <laughs> benefit. <laughs> we better see you at the. Yeah, I yeah, guess yeah, I better. Definitely. <laughs> I um, had a program on bicycling in Richfield, and I was told to get a bike. Uh, <laughs> so I just really want to thank you. I know you have a full day's work put in already, and so and then you came on to the show, so I can't tell you how much I appreciate uh, what you've done. Thank you very much. It was our pleasure.